you please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. This morning's scripture reading will be Matthew 21 verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Zechariah. Say to the daughters of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their colts on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that follow shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee. Amen. Thank you, Phil. It's always good to see you guys in the great time of year. It's finally cooling off. We even have Canadians in the house, so <laughs> you know it's got to be a good sign that uh, things are getting much, much better around here. So that's, that's a great thing. Um, lots of stuff coming up. Mission Sunday is coming up in a couple of weeks, and that's not that far off. And you will be impressed at the amount of things that are done in missions around the world by this church. And we don't talk about them all the time, but wow, is there ever a lot that happens. And that's going to be a special day when you get to be able to give and uh, fund all of those things. So we have a display back here. Ken Fox came and set this up. I understand this is what he rode in when he was in Thailand. <laughs> and so they have different kinds of transportation over there. The hard part was believing that Gene actually pulled this. <laughs> you know, that was the harder part. But. Uh, Yes, it is real and authentic, and I'm not verifying any of the rest of the stories. So, Harvest Festival's on Saturday. Lots of great things are going on. I'm glad we're all able to worship God. I want to talk about going from a critic to praise. I don't know how, where you place yourself this morning. Maybe you woke up and it was a great day and the birds are singing and you're full of praise for God. Gabby's certainly done a great job song leading even without much voice. And uh, so it's just always great to see. Or maybe you didn't wake up that way. Maybe the coffee maker didn't quite come on in time and you haven't had quite enough coffee, and so how can you be praising without coffee? Because coffee is the source of all praise. <laughs> That's not true, but anyway, sometimes we have some other things that go on. I think this may be one of the hardest things for me. I'll just go ahead and confess that, okay? Because when you're in the place of trying to make things happen and trying to get stuff to work, your place is kind of to figure out what's not working and make it better. But the temptation is always to figure out what's not working. And so this isn't working and that isn't working. And there's something back here that isn't working. And there's something down there that isn't working. And so you're constantly bombarded by all the things that need to be fixed. And when you're a person that always has to fix things anyway, whether it's broken or not, 
Yeah, that's my wife. She already knows. <laughs> I mean, when you get it new, you might as well take it apart and see how it works, right? <laughs> and so you end up being the critic. And this is maybe one of those things that uh, needs to be turned around a whole lot. Some things do not need to be fixed. And things that are not mine and that I could give up on and get it... I don't need to fix them. I don't need to be in them. But it's a habit we get into, I think. And I saw this. Some people find fault like there's a reward for it. Uh, it. It seems like sometimes we're so good at that part. And maybe we need to be better at the praise part. Because I think getting into the habit of being critical all the time can destroy our praise. And when you look at Jesus, you see a, a guy who promotes praise. Certainly he deals with all the sins and the disease and all the hard things of life. And yet he's a guy who seems to invoke more praise and fulfill more passages of praise than anything else, than anyone else. And so the passage that Phil has read to us in Matthew chapter 21 talks about an uncharacteristic event. It's a great time of praise for Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem. He's been to Jerusalem many times and he's never done this before. This is just one of those things, one of those times where, okay, it's time for praise. And he waits at the top. There's a big hill that goes down and up the other side into Jerusalem. And he waits there and he says, go get me the colt and the donkey and they go get them they bring them to because this is going to be different this is a time when they need to be able to praise and he even has a prophecy that this fulfills and the prophecy is about a king that's coming in and so this is the coronation ceremony this is the time when the king of the jews is now going to be coming in with the hero's welcome. And there are times when this would happen, when the conquering hero came back, he would have a parade that kind of went into town and they welcome him back as the conquering hero. And so Jesus is doing that. He's their king. It's the coronation. It's the announcement or pronouncement of here, the king has come to you, the Messiah, the one you've been looking for. And it's a time of recognition and a time of purpose. And so they bring those things for him and they put their cloaks on the donkeys and they put their cloaks on the road. And it's just a time when the, the crowd is shouting. And you know how it gets when, when it's such an exciting place and time and yet nothing has happened. That's what's strange about it. There has been no healing. There, there has been no great miracle. He, he didn't just feed the 5,000. He didn't do anything. He didn't part a sea or anything like that. It's just he gets to the top of the hill and he says, it's time. It's time for this to happen. And since it's time for this to happen, he says, all right, so it's a buildup of everything that has gone before. It's a buildup of all the people and what they have done. And so it's talking about how they have, he has healed all of these people, he has taught and they finally understood. They're able to see how it all works. And so he comes into Jerusalem as this conquering hero. And it's like an announcement. And the people who follow are always amazed. And they're always full of awe. And they've got branches that they're shouting with. And they've got their cloaks that they're using. And it's not just borrowing a coat. It's, you're so important. I'll let the donkey you're riding on walk over my coat. And it's so loud, and there's so much praise that happens. The Pharisees are really upset. If you read the Luke version of this, it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, 
I tell you, if these are silent, the very stones would cry out. What an incredible time it is for a time of praise. And it's a time of praise for Jesus. Now, it's not just exciting like they've won something, though, or like there's a good sale, you know, or, or that you got a new whatchamajigger. There, there isn't anything like that. This is just praise for who Jesus is and that they understand and that they know this is holy. This is God on earth. This is an angel praise of what comes, and the people are so excited about this. They are literally walking with God into Jerusalem. They are walking with their Messiah. Wow, what a time of praise that should be, right? Man, that should be so, so exciting to realize what's going on there. And then in verse 21, in verse 12, excuse me, chapter 21, the Jews, then Jesus entered the temple and he drove out all who sold and brought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise? What an incredible time. And yet you still have critics right in the middle of the crowd, right in the middle of everything that's going on and, and everyone is praising and yet you still have critics there to point out, please stop them from saying this. We don't like this. And there's always the person who's there to say, I don't like this, I don't want this. And Jesus is no exception. So how does he deal with it? He kind of answers their question, or he just ignores it, you know. Do you hear what they're shouting? Yeah, if they don't shout, rock shout. So which one do you want? I think you're happier with them shouting rather than the whole earth and creation shouting that the Son of God is here. And then when he gets there, the children, that's just amazing. But Jesus is not a critic. He doesn't criticize and say, now you shouldn't really have those people selling doves and selling lambs and changing money inside the temple. That's not what ought to be happening here. You shouldn't have them. He simply goes in and pushes them out. That's not a critic. That's a guy who does something about it. He acts on what he knows. You're not doing this. And when you have a guy who's very, very passionate about all of this, he is so passionate about this, he, he, they don't even refuse him. He has the scripture quote, this is to be a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a robber's den. It's out of Isaiah 56. There's no whip. He's already done this one time, and so maybe that's why they know to be afraid. And that, you know, okay, we've got to move now. But this also isn't about a riot. He doesn't get anybody else. It doesn't say there's another person that even helps him. This is about Jesus. And Jesus goes in and Jesus clears the temple. It's, it's not like, okay, I've got 13 of us and we're going to run you out of town. Not at all. I think they're there, but it's Jesus. who. Did. I mean, he just brought a huge crowd in. Probably thousands of people, couldn't they have done something about that? But that's not what happens. Jesus goes in and Jesus drives them out. And he says, you don't belong here. This is a house of prayer. And he comes to put God back on the throne. Because this is God's house. You see, it's not about him. 
It's not about what he doesn't like. It's not about the things that Jesus wants and I'm going to bring a new religion or a new Christianity or anything like that. He says, no, you're doing this and you should not be here. And he sets God back on the throne and says, this is to be a place of praise. And so he comes and he's concerned more about God's house. He's angry for God, not for himself. When we get critical, it's because we want something. It's about us, and it's about what we prefer, and about how we want things, or it wasn't fast enough, or good enough, or right enough, or whatever was wrong with it, then that's what we turn to as critical, and Jesus is not doing that here. His plan was not to destroy the temple. That's not it at all. It's a very targeted aggression, right at the people who are abusing the house of God, the money changers. And then he brings peace to the temple. And the blind and the lame come to him. They're not afraid. And he heals them. And the hands of violence are also the hands of healing. And then you still got the children. It's like they're just oblivious to everything. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. They're still playing and still they've caught on to the song by now. It is just keeping on going and, and they still praise. Hosanna to the song, son of David. His praise from innocence saying a great truth of how good this is. And again, the critics, the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. Did you notice that in the passage? Let me give you that. Maybe I can't back up. When they saw the wonderful things that he did, that's when they criticized. It's amazing that you could see the wonderful things that he did and try and stop it. Try and stop the healing, try and stop the children. You kids quit playing. We don't want to hear that. No more son of David. No more Messiah talk. Because that offends us. They're indignant. Such behavior. This is beneath us. We don't deserve this. You should not be here. And they don't praise for healing. There's no Messiah joy that happens there. They're just saying, do you hear what they're saying? He's like, yeah, it's Psalms 8 too. That's what will happen. It, God brings praise out of babies. Praise comes from everywhere. If praise comes from everywhere, even children, even babies, shouldn't it come from us? Doesn't that make sense? And sometimes we get caught up too much in what should be happening. It should be obvious. Praise ought to come from us as well. And so why are they trying to silence this praise that comes from God? Well, it's not convenient. It's not what we believe. It's not what we think. And we don't like it. And the criticism is all about them. And they can't see what God is doing right in front of them. They can't see that this is from God, that this is something that's wonderful, that this is something that comes because God wants it. See, we're critical about circumstance, but not so much about morals and not so much about important things, more about what makes us comfortable. Okay, maybe I'm being critical of critics now. <laughs> it's always a danger in this every time you do it. And so I have two parables for you. Should be in the Bible. People may argue they're not. At least I couldn't find them. Here's the first one. Is, shouldn't the Bible say this? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. I mean, I hear that quoted in churches a number of times. Do you know what that means? That something is squeaking, right? That there are wheels that are around that need to be greased. And no, he's not talking about that at all. He's talking about people. 
And so here's the principles of the parable. If you squeak loud enough and long enough, you will get grease, assuming that's what you want. And you will get grease before anyone else. And if you do not squeak, you may never get grease. It will cause a problem for others, but who cares? It's all about us anyway. This is used by a lot of people. We believe in this. We hold this up as much as scripture or anything else. What would happen if the person who's the most critical never got any attention? What would happen then? Would we be more critical or less critical? And I'm not trying to do away with the fact that there are things that need to change and need to be better, and certainly that's important, and certainly that's good. But I just want you to think about it. One of the things the news is trying to deal with now, as much as anything else, is when you've got a serial killer, or when you've got somebody who has done one of the mass shootings, do we put his name and his picture in the paper? Do we put it on TV? Do we advertise? Because that was his intention in the whole beginning. He wanted that attention. Squeaky wheel, right? His agenda. You're going to listen to me now. If I can be violent enough, you're going to listen to me. And that's the principle here. Not biblical. Not what Jesus would ever say. Not a way of looking at this. And it's used by everyone. It's used by Israel in the wilderness. We're going to, we're going to grumble. We're going to complain. We don't have water. We don't have food. We don't like the food. We, and so God takes away their blessing. Here's the second parable that goes along with this. And you need to take these together. Squeaky whale gets the grease, but the quacking duck gets shot. <laughs> so you might need to decide which one you are. Because if there's too much squeaking going on, then it is just not going to work. In Numbers 14, you see them complaining, we're not going in, there's giants in the land. God says, no, you're not. And he takes away their blessing. He says, that's what you're saying, that's what you're complaining about. He says, I will give you everything you're asking for. Every fear that you have ever had, I will bring on you. And sure enough, it all comes true. They were afraid they would die in the wilderness. Yes, you will get to. Because you didn't believe in God. You didn't follow what he was trying to say. And so they wander 38 years until those people die off. And so what does it mean to be critical? You realize that nothing is perfect. But everything is not broken. It's just where we live. And critical is where you never find any praise. Certainly, you need to be able to say something if something is wrong. Is critical always bad? No, it's not. Sometimes you need to say something. Well, nothing ever gets fixed unless we know that. If it, we may not need to be as critical, just fix it. Figure out a way for you to do it. Do what makes a difference. If it isn't working, say something. But it's not just saying it when it's about you. It's about saying it when it's about God and saying it when it's about other things that God's concerned with. So can we never disagree? We can find a solution. We can find a better place. Don't just sit back and say nothing and be upset and frustrated. But I think it comes down to this. Winning the war of words inside your soul means learning to defy the inner critic. But that's not the problem. The problem is, what does it take to get praise? We've got to defy the inner critic first of all and deal with him first of all, but then that's really not the issue. What does it take to get praise? And we may start out skeptical. Some of Jesus' own disciples started out skeptical. Nathaniel had a scriptural 
objection to Jesus even being Messiah, Nazareth. You can't come from Nazareth. And he overcame that. I think two things. We have to believe in something bigger than ourselves. And it needs to be about that. Not about us, not about our comfort, not about what we want. It isn't our church. It belongs to Jesus. And it needs to be about what he wants. And we're just part of something that is bigger than us. And the second thing is you've got to put God on the throne. Because it isn't about us. Lips are for praise, not for grumbling. And that's the purpose he gave them. We don't complain about convenience. And we're not going to be squeaky wheels. Just go find some grease so that you can get some relief. Some things are worth fighting about. But most things are not. And so be careful what you do with that. So when do we praise? You realize, survey in the Bible says nine out of ten lepers healed never praise. Well, it wasn't really a survey. It's just the story of what happens when he heals the ten lepers. And nine just keep on going like, oh, well, this was good. One thing checked off my list, heal my leprosy. And so they just able to keep right on going and say, well, that was lucky. No. And one comes back realizing the great thing that has happened to him. He has been completely healed of this horrible disease where it just takes apart his body. And he comes back praising God. And, and as he comes up to Jesus, I think one of the most important things telling, he, he comes back and Jesus says, well, where, where are the nine? And don't know. And Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well. And that may be the difference between the nine and the one. Because he approaches life out of faith. And he says, your faith has made you. I don't know if the rest of them turn back into lepers or not. It doesn't give us that, fortunately. But what he does say is, your faith made you well. And that's the most important thing when you approach life. It's all about your faith and what happened to you. In Luke chapter 18, verse 35, another situation. He drew near to Jericho. A blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing the crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. And he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and following him and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Of course. It's a reason for praise when somebody has been healed. It's a reason for praise when prayers are answered, when someone gets out of the hospital, when they're their situation, and we seem to get a lot of sicknesses and a lot of different things that happen to us. It's a reason for praise when those things are relieved. Don't just go, well, okay, that was good. Glad I got a good doctor's report. Thankful for doctors. No, yeah, it's people have been praying for you, and it's more about God and about what God does. And praise comes out of faith. Because if there's no faith, there's no reason to praise. If it isn't that you believe that God made the difference in this, praise comes out of faith that has been fulfilled. And that's really where our praise comes from. What is God fulfilling in your life? What is God doing in your life that makes a difference? How do we get to praise? Well, I think it's the same as the ten lepers. The one who praises heal, has been healed because he believed Jesus did it because of his faith. Doctrine doesn't bring praise. 
Don't know why. But for some reason, it doesn't. You can have the absolute perfect right doctrine. It does not seem to bring praise. But it does when you have faith. And when God is working and when that faith is on that doctrine. We believe Jesus can do something. We believe Jesus died on a cross. We believe Jesus changes our life. We believe Jesus can take away sin. We believe we can have a covenant with him. We believe he gives us the Holy Spirit. We believe when we are baptized into him, that Holy Spirit comes to be part of us and protects us and helps us. And we are able to have fruit from that spirit. And we believe that he blesses and we believe we have a reason for praise because of all of those things. And we don't need to be critical of God. We need to believe. We need to pray. So can you get to praise today? Is this something you're able to do? Can Jesus bring praise out of babies? Then can't he bring praise out of us? So what do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus? He isn't just passing by. He's here. And he stays. And are you a part of the praise? Out of the mouth of babes and out of the mouth of his church comes praise for Jesus. And maybe today you're caught in sin and you still feel like you're so burdened down. Well, this is a day for praise because Jesus forgives those. And Jesus is able to take all those away. He doesn't make life perfect but he gives reason for praise. Are you part of that? Would you come while we stand and sing?